Tan Peach is going to be talking about Triple Aim, which of course is why probably a lot of you are here today. He is the Executive Director of the Health Council of East Central Florida, the health planning agency for the Orlando and the Space Coast area. And before joining the Health Council in December of 2010, Ken's career spans a lot of great disciplines within the healthcare uh, industry, which makes him a, a very valuable uh, expert in his field. He's had medical practice business development for different companies. He's owned a health insurance agency. He's been administrator in hospitals, health systems, senior living facilities. Um, he's been the American Hospital Association Regional Executive for Florida and Puerto Rico and also the Vice President of Integrated Delivery Systems with the Florida Hospital Association. So those are some of the highlights in his career. And I must say, I have had the privilege of working with Ken uh, back when I started with internet marketing in 1998 when he was at Orlando Health and he was one of my clients and got to meet him there. So it's amazing how time flies. Um, Ken holds a BA in communications degree and an MBA with health services administrative degree. And he's also a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. So he's got a lot of credentials behind him, and we are so honored to have you here today to talk about Triple A. So thank you, Ken. Thank you, Dorothy. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, you know, when you're doing a presentation, you always want to start out and kind of explain and have everybody understand the concept. But I'm going to ask you to wait a few minutes, and instead I'm going to do what I do when I talk at UCF to student groups, and that is give you a little background. The beauty, as uh, Dorothy mentioned, having been in healthcare since 1985, I'm talking to a lot of people now that I find out when I'm out there, I think to myself, they weren't even born then, or they were children at that point in time. It's amazing how time passes by. But uh, in this particular case, um, in looking at um, or speaking to students, it helps to give a little bit of history um, to kind of position where we are. Today, I'm not going to give a lot of history, but I am going to go back. Part of this is preparing for great change. Um, healthcare costs are unsustainable. If you look at this chart, we're looking at the U.S. Um, and on a per capita healthcare cost compared to other countries around the world. Um, there's a basic reason for this pointed out to me by a, um, an individual about two, three years ago who came to speak in, um, in Florida at the Florida Hospital Association. said, if you want to know why it is that our costs are so much higher, we have flipped versus the other, many of the other countries you see here. They fund primary care first and high technology second. We are, I mean, if you, all you have to do is drive down Orange Avenue and whether you pass the Florida Hospital campus, the Orlando Health campus, the cranes, the new equipment being dropped into buildings, we um, focus on high tech, but we fund primary care after that. Um, and so as a result of that, we do tend to have very high costs and, and it is unsustainable. I don't know the exact percentage, but probably most of you know what our GDP is right now. We're running eight, anywhere between 18 and 20 percent of our GDP on health care. So at some point in time, that has to stop. And obviously, a large focus um, of the effort is to figure out how to begin to control that cost, those uh, rising costs. Um, the employers are giving up. Um, you're probably noticing that the number of employers providing health coverage <clears throat> is decreasing. That was covered just a, in the last two days or so in a, one of the media stories. But as you look at this, you understand why. Because look at the percentage as far as health insurance when you look at the benefits cost for employers. So, um, And this is just two industries that I happen to pick simply because we've got both of these, obviously, in, in this area, especially leisure and hospitality. So if you look at that, I mean, um, it's squeezing other things, uh, not to mention the fact of other cost overall for those companies. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a movement from fee-for-service medicine, and this is a good deal of why we're going to talk about the triple aim today, a move from fee-for-service medicine to some type of value-based, or as it's been called, moving from volume to value. Um, and that is a, a basic equation that's, again, happening very quickly. Within the last two days, study came out indicating a 10% increase in risk uh, sharing uh, programs uh, for commercial insurers in this country in a very short period of time. So we're moving very, very rapidly from a fee-for-service environment. So we went ahead and conservatively said, okay, if this is where we are today, this is a McKesson study, if this is where we are today, and you can see over half of the business is fee-for-service. You arrive at your physician's practice, you go ahead and you have the service, and you pay for the service, or you pay using your insurance 
for that service. What we're moving to instead are a variety of different approaches, and we'll talk about these a little bit later. Capitation, which is not new. Um, I was dealing with that on the hospital side and then the physician side back in the mid-90s, so it's not something new. Pay for performance, bundle global, um, and we'll talk about reference pricing today too, which we're seeing a, a great deal of growth in. So knowing that that's going to occur, why talk about the triple aim? Let me give you a little history on the triple aim first. Um, the triple aim was developed by Dr. Don Berwick, um, a pediatrician up in Boston who founded an organization called IHI, Institute for Health Improvement, um, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And IHI, um, uh, uh, he and another physician, John Whittington, got together and they said, you know, what is it if we were going to look at the system of the future, the healthcare system, what are the three elements that we really need to look at to try and control and, and that would give us the best? And the first element of that, or no particular order, population health. Population health, how do we keep people in the preventive part of health care? And I'm going to show you a diagram in just a moment that's going to look at this. How do we keep them at the so-called bottom of the pyramid with preventive care instead of waiting until they get to the more expensive care at the top of the pyramid? The second one is experience of care. How do we improve the experience, the service, the quality, and the outcomes of the experience for an individual when they're actually receiving care? And then the third element is per capita cost. Um, that's going to be an interesting one to talk about because that's where we'll go back to the slide just a moment ago and we'll look at the different types of models that are coming that are moving us from fee-for-service to volume-based uh, or to value-based health care. It's also interesting because if you think about the Affordable Care Act, um, <clears throat> to quote somebody from the state who came down to the Florida Blue uh, Foundation uh, program about two years ago here in Orlando, he said that was the most misnamed piece of legislation he had ever seen because it doesn't do anything to address the cost of malpractice and it doesn't do anything to address the cost of care. It's all about getting more people care, but it really doesn't address the name affordable. So how do we make health care more affordable? Incidentally, the triple aim has been adopted by numerous organizations, including close to home Florida Hospital as one of its driving strategies of talking to the folks at Florida Hospital and they've said basically this is what we look at for our strategy going forward. So what does this mean? Let's talk about population health first. We're talking again about a move from sick to health care. And as you'll notice on this pyramid, um, I developed this model when I first got on the board of PCAN, the Primary Care Access Network here in Orlando. And we only had three, the top three elements. And we said, okay, service use, the amount of use of where we get our health care is broadest at the bottom, okay, and it's narrowest at the top. And I'm talking as a recovering hospital administrator um, who spent many years of my career putting heads in beds. My whole focus was fill the hospital, keep it busy and, and going, and find new services and things that we can provide. But if you look at it, there's, I would imagine that there's people in this room who, well, maybe not because of the careers where you've chosen to be in healthcare, but there's an awful lot of people who probably have never set, set foot in a hospital before. And so um, we tend to think because the hospital is the, at the top, it's, it's very visible, it, you know, significant investment that um, the world revolves around the hospital, at least we do when we work in healthcare in the hospital industry. But if you look at it, then we have outpatient services. So by that, as opposed to primary care, I'm talking about specialty practices, outpatient imaging centers, and others. Um, and then you drop down to primary care. So when I arrived on the PCAN board about four years ago, I said, okay, now here's where we are, and what we're trying to do is figure out how to serve more of the population by providing more access to the primary care delivery model. That's great. But maybe we need to take one step further than that, and that's where we introduce the bottom, which is care at home. Intel and GE, speaking a few years ago, um, and then reiterated probably within the last year, they believe that healthcare, 50% of healthcare, will be delivered in the home by 2020. Um, I recently had an opportunity to view a unit um, that we're actually looking for a home for right now in Brevard County. Uh, it's the size of a carry-on suitcase. Put it in the back of the ambulance. This ambulance drove around the panhandle of Florida and did 10 EMS calls um, on a particular day. And I have to share with you with simulated EMS calls. Um, so basically, they would roll up. The uh, paramedics did not know what they were responding to, nor did the physician who 
was standing by in Pensacola, Florida. So the unit would go out, they would take this unit into the home, and within a matter of a couple of minutes have established telemetry, audio, and video back to Pensacola, Florida. Physician sitting in the office is able to direct the paramedics in terms of what care they're providing. I will tell you that of 10 simulated calls that day, nine did not require transport, not even to the ambulance. This was, they were, paramedics were able to do what they needed to do in the home. Now as we look at community paramedicine as a way to expand population health, we have a program called Phone to Home that you'll soon be hearing about in Osceola County. We met with the fire chief two days ago. Uh, their call reports now will include a requirement or an option for, a, for an individual, a patient, to go ahead and opt to hear from a navigator who will connect them to primary care services to keep them healthy and, and away from having to call and use the 911 service repeatedly. Um, and in Satellite Beach, Florida, we're working on putting this unit into the ambulance over there so that we can, in essence, provide primary care visits in the home for physicians in that community who have said, I want to be able to go ahead and maintain the health of my population, of my patients, and I want to do it without having to have somebody who's, let's say, frail and 87 years old, I'm not picking on any 87 year olds, but, um, and I don't want to have to have them come to my office and I can't afford to go out of my office, so let's connect them and I will go ahead and work through your com community paramedic who will go out and make this visit. So there's an example of how we're looking on a larger scale. But the other thing, if you look at this model, you'll notice our objective is to reduce healthcare expenditures. And the way to do that is to focus on the bottom two elements of this pyramid. How can we bring more services to individuals in the home or in the primary care setting? Now, those with chronic medical conditions, you'll notice, and you've all heard the statistics, 5% of the population, Medicare population, 55% of the expense, uh, the employed population. Um, we saw that in the model in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where we first saw the ambulatory intensive caring unit. The AICU model, they looked at the uh, employees of the casinos in Atlantic City and they were running significant medical bills. One example, and I always hate to give this over meal time, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway, because it's a good example. They wondered why this one gentleman with asthma was constantly ending up in the emergency department in Atlantic City uh, Medical Center. So instead of sending, uh, uh, bringing him in and looking at the medical, they decided let's look at what his housing situation is. So the AICU, which is basically case managers, went out to where he lived, and the building they found was, um, Let's put it this way, they've not seen an exterminator in a while. So what was happening was the insect life in the building was aggravating his asthma and he was ending up in the emergency department. They fixed that problem, I don't know whether they moved him or fixed the building. Whatever they did, no more emergency visits for asthma from that individual. So here again, this is looking at how do we keep people healthy, it's a focus on health. It's not necessarily a medical only option, it's looking at using what we'll call, and we'll talk about this a little later too, a smart team case management, uh, paramedics perhaps, community health workers, medical assistants and others as a team to support the primary care delivery model. So the goal is, is basically <clears throat> management of individuals at the top of this. And, and again, I'll mention this in a moment. Now, those that are served by population health are those at the bottom. We want to keep people in the preventive healthcare model as much as possible. We want individuals using all the variety of different approaches that we have available to them for primary health care so they don't get to the point where they have to move up the pyramid. Now in this particular case, um, part of that is what type of intervention do we do and where do we do it? And again, using the similar pyramid model, and you're going to see another pyramid. I don't know what it is about pyramids, but they just seem to work. Um, here you'll see a low risk population. I will share with you these risk these are based on, and I normally I source these things, this comes from the Healthcare Advisory Board, these, some of these statistics and numbers, but there are numerous other numbers being used, and for those interested, we're actually doing a webinar next Tuesday, a national webinar, um, looking at emergent risk, which is the population right in the middle, it's another name for rising risk. But if you look at this, 60 to 80 percent of the uninsured, and I prepared this for purposes of showing to um, uh, some of the clinics and others that serve that, but you could say the same thing, 68% of the population of any physician's practice or any um, uh, community are those that are low risk. Um, and for those, we want to focus on prevention. How do we keep them healthy and out of the next segment of the pyramid, which is the rising risk? 
That's the 15 to 35 percent um, who have probably two or more chronic conditions. There we want to intervene. Um, and how we intervene is we want to get in there early. And I think the best description of this came from Dr. Neil Kaufman, who will be on our webinar next week, who said to me, you want to get in there before there is organ damage. So if we're talking about diabetes, when do we intervene? We want to intervene pre-diabetes. And some of you may be aware that the local YMCA's offer pre-diabetes education. What we're trying to do, again, is get in there early and prevent the organ damage that will occur if that's not addressed. So that's an intervention level. And then finally, the high risk, that's really a management of that population that's already moved up there. It would be nice to be able to say if we just capped that top population of 5 to 10 percent, that's probably a manageable population. Wouldn't it be great and we could just manage them carefully and, and that would at least reduce the problem? Well, if we did, we wouldn't be addressing those that are moving up into that category, but more so there's about a one-third population that moves every year. Now, I'd like to tell you that they all move down the pyramid, but in likelihood, we just lose them all together um, over the course of a year. So that's not a stable population. So just as we have to watch out for the rising risk, we also know that that high-risk population is going to be hard to manage because we can't really quantify people year to year to year that are receiving that service. Uh, this just came out of a study released about two weeks ago. Um, and I think it's a great example. It looks at past and present. You know, we generally, we look always to the physician as the head of the care team. Um, and we encourage that. And as we talk about population health, we always look at a model that's directed by the physician but may be delivered by other individuals. And those might be nurses, behaviorists, uh, medical assistants, and there's others uh, on there. Uh, obviously, there's uh, PAs, so there are nurse practitioners, and so on that, that uh, also fit into that. But look at the future. We have the same four positions listed at the top, but now we're introducing retail models. I'm working with a physician right now who has, has his, uh, he works for a company that has as its, um, popu its clients the major retail pharmacies across the country. And what they're working on right now, and we're probably two years away from this, is the ability for when you walk into a minute clinic or a health clinic at Walgreens, um, what you'll do is you're seeing the nurse practitioner, and that nurse practitioner is going to say, hmm, you know, if something doesn't sound right here, let's consult the cardiologist. Turns around, hits the button, and is instantly connected to a state licensed cardiologist uh, via telehealth who can monitor what is being done, what is being said. The nurse practitioner now becomes the hands um, and the eyes and, and so forth. But this particular physician can now go ahead and provide a cardiac um, uh, evaluation for the patient, even though they're in a retail health clinic. So the idea that you can only do so much in a retail health clinic will go away as these things occur. How? Uh, uh, I was asked not to get into a lot of questions, but I'm hoping most of you have seen telehealth. If you've not seen it, it's the most incredible thing. The first time I saw it in operation was a year and a half ago uh, in Kissimmee. Um, and the gentleman in Georgia who was sending the, uh, who was the one that was uh, the demonstration person for us, put the camera up to his newly shaved, it was a morning meeting, uh, and his whiskers were about this long, you know, a huge on HD on the screen down at uh, Osceola Regional Medical Center. So when you realize that you can see, because these are magnified images, better physicians who have been sitting there with me have said they can see better than they can see actually one-on-one. -on -one. So the ability to see these things and to communicate with telehealth is huge. So we look at a combination of the first two there, retail and telehealth, and then finally self-directed consumers. And there's a great deal of interest uh, in this community in how do we get individuals to do what we know they know they need to do, but they don't do it. How do we get people to embrace being healthy and doing the things they need to do, eating the right things and, and doing the right things? And I hope nobody watched me eat breakfast this morning because <laughs> I'm not a good example. Do as I say, not as I do. All right, let's talk about care for individuals. Um, medical practices are going to have to change. And again, this is being driven a lot in the area of economics, but there are some other real advantages for the patient in the same sense. The office has been the revenue center. Now, for those of you who are physicians who have been handling Medicare Advantage or Medicare Choice before that, in all likelihood, most of your business or a large portion of your business is risk-based medicine. And we'll talk again the next section about some of the models, capitation, global cap, and, and some of the other things you're dealing with. So for those, they're already looking at the right-hand column in most cases. 
It's the rest of the physicians who have been relying very much on fee-for-service model that are now going to have to make some significant changes. And this is not going to be a comfortable change. Um, the hospitals are facing the exact same thing. When do you make the switch? How many, what percentage of your population of patients that you're caring for in a population health model, what percentage are going to have to flip over to a different type of payment system where you're being paid to prevent um, sickness instead of to cure it? How, where is it that you make that switch? And it's very painful and a very time-consuming process to do that. And you can imagine for an organization as large as a hospital in particular, how painful that can be to go through that transition. And you have to change your mindset, and you can't, it's very difficult to sit there and say, okay, this person's fee for service, so I'm going to give them this, this, and this, and oh wait, this person over here is not fee for service, I'm paid a fixed amount, how do I manage the care of that individual to keep them healthy? So what we're going to look at is the office moving from the revenue center in a volume based to a value based. It becomes a cost center uh, to us. Um, we're going to get paid a fixed income for the services that we provide. Um, and then what we have to do is figure out how to keep those services uh, there and how to take care of the patients. And I want to mention here for a moment um, that uh, there were all kinds of stories that we used to hear. First of all, how many of you, you know, you'd probably be familiar with the story for Medicare Plus Choice when the government first um, authorized basically Part C of Medicare and began to say, okay, we'll turn this over to a company. Well, you probably heard the stories that a lot of companies for enrolling individuals in the health plan in those days uh, would rent a second floor meeting room, and oh, by the way, in a building that didn't have an elevator. So only those individuals healthy enough to climb to the meeting could get enrolled in the health plan. Now, whether or not that well, true or not, but that was the story at the time. Well. So you would also look at this and say, well, wait a minute. If I'm being paid a fixed income for services and I have money flowing in every month from the insurance company in, in this type of a model, in this risk model, um, what's the incentive for me to do anything? The less I do, the more I keep in my pocket. And at one time, that also was a great concern. And that was before we got into uh, HEDIS and before we began to look at um, having to meet certain requirements for the health plan to earn its stars and the health plan in turn turning around saying, okay, physician, you have to get these preventive things taken care of because it ends up hurting the health plan, our marketability, our service, and obviously our patient population if they're not getting what you're being paid to do. So we have some stop, uh, some safety uh, uh, there that we didn't have necessarily in, in past years. Uh, maximizing service utilization. The more you come into my office, the more I get paid versus managing utilization. I tell individuals, now you come into my practice, If I, this is when I was working with the medical group, um, it's, we're calling you not because we want to bill you again for your charge for you to come in. We want you to come in because we want to make sure that you're staying well because it's going to be a lot easier for us to see you today than it is um, if you're very, very sick or in the emergency department. Um, we've gone to the payer concern about the amount of utilization that that payer is having to pay a physician's practice for taking care of those patients to one of under treatment and there again just as I described that's why there are restrictions and there are reports on a monthly basis practices and the physicians are getting reports saying okay have you done these things that are required picked up a really nice helpful piece and I have this for anybody who'd like to see it I don't have it today but I can send it to you from a physician down in South Florida who put on one page a summary of what every one of his patients, generally depending on gender and, and age, I don't remember the exact specifications, need to have done when they come in. So when you come into his practice or his clinic in South Florida, his medical assistant, as they're getting you in there, says, have you had your colonoscopy if you're over 50? Have you had your whatever? And depending if you say no, then they check off as this is required. And then when the physician comes in to see the patient, he just goes ahead and authorizes those things. So there's an automatic catch, if you will, very easy to do to make sure that you're in compliance with the insurance plan. In this case, it's a, a clinic for the uninsured. He just wants to make sure everybody's getting the preventive tests that they should get. Um, we've talked about the individual providing the care, the physician, everything built around the physician. Um, when I was working with a practice up in, in Longwood in a, a global cap arrangement, um, when I was recruiting physicians, most of the time, the physicians would uh, come in and say, okay, now, how many patients am I going to have to see in your practice? I'm used to 25, 30 patient encounters a day. Uh, no, we only bring physicians in who will see about 18 to 20 patients a day. Well, how do you make a living on that? 
Well, if your focus is to spend more time with the patient because you're wanting to keep them healthy, you need that time. And because we're not operating on a, a, value, a volume basis, we can take the time to see the patient and provide that care. So, um, and in this particular case, we also look at the team. It's now being called the smart team that provides the service. The way as we face a shortage in physicians of about 90,000, that's the projection for 2020 from the medical schools. They're saying we'll be about 90, 91,000 physicians short by 2020. So you look at that and you say, well, what are we gonna do? Well, part of that is you look at a smart team. You look at the capability of leveraging a medical practice, one physician or two physicians in a practice by using a combination of technology as we've talked about and also smart team or people. Um, and you've been paid for what's being done as opposed to uh, what will be done for the member. Um, and the focus, again, is to manage the health conditions. So we talked about paraprofessionals. So in this particular case, and this is a great model, we, the Health Council, and I should, uh, I was asked earlier, what's the Health Council? Uh, so let me just, it was mentioned at the introduction, it's the Health Planning Agency for Orange, Osceola, Seminole, and Brevard Counties. We have the, the um, sincere pleasure of being able to work in all four counties, and part of that in Seminole County is we're um, handling the system of care in Seminole. Seminole County government uh, funds $120,000 a year for the uninsured. And what we do is we want to leverage that because we have found that over the last two or three years, those dollars no longer last a full year. And those of you are familiar with the sharing center, they basically go out of their way to sustain the program on their own as a philanthropic organization for a month or two until the money is back in for the next year's budget. So we have to do something about that. We're looking at a variety of different things. But interesting model we're looking at putting in place, and I don't have a diagram of it to show you today, but it's built around this. Um, Dr. Sidney Garfield. Dr. Garfield had a medical practice in 1938 out west, and he wasn't doing real well. He, most of the people that he was serving couldn't afford to come see him and pay for their visit. So he's in his office one day trying to figure out what to do, and there's a rapping at the door, and he answers it, and the guy says, uh, Hi, I'm Mr. Kaiser, and I'm building a dam, and I would like to see if there's a way that you could take care of my patients. I'll go ahead and pay you for my employees and their family members to keep them well. Well, the first thing that happened at uh, the beginning of the Kaiser Permanente plan is Dr. Garfield said, I realized I had to put up barriers because as soon as the board got out that care was paid for, he had a line around his building. So what's the barrier? He said, I've got to figure out where do these individuals fall by triaging them, by figuring out what do they have. And I figured out over time that if I put that in, there were some other things I could do as well. Well, 1970, he wrote an article in Scientific America, and I have the diagram, and we're now implementing his model in Seminole County. We're building an education model at the sharing center so that individuals who don't necessarily need to see the physician can go to physician-approved resource and, and materials to teach them how to stay well and to teach them what they should know about health or what the issues are that they're dealing with. So that's the education component, and guess what? A health educator can provide that. Doesn't have to be a physician, but it can be a health education function. Now, the next thing is we have the problem of individuals with chronic conditions. So we're in the process of, of talking to organizations. I mentioned it before, pre-diabetes education, chronic care management education, uh, arthritis education. These are courses that are evidence-based from Stanford that we're going to begin offering in Central Florida. So this is the piece that can involve social workers, RNs, physical therapists, pharmacists, case manager. Again, not physicians under their direction, but we don't require and we can then free up the physician to be over in the right column, which is sick care. Um, and that's where they can focus. Uh, and incidentally, how do you connect all of these things? Um, we have a health informatics student from UCF right now who's got about 15 to 18 companies that they're talk she's talking to about how are we going to link the um, safety net organizations in Seminole County through some type of information exchange. The Central Florida Rio is gone, um, and what we're trying to do is figure out what economically can we afford to do that will allow us to move information between those organizations. So the point here is that as part of the, um, the way to address the patient experience is to do it by using other expertise, not just the physician. And how do we also involve people themselves? How many of you um, have the uh, Fitbit or something along those lines? Probably a good deal of you. 
Uh, so we see Fitbit, we use individual devices. Pretty soon those will be more than just communicating to your smartphone. There is no reason right now, in fact, I've been talking to an organization interested in piloting this, where we put basically a, a device that measures, for example, blood sugar, um, that wirelessly communicates that to your smartphone. Your smartphone then routinely checks in with a center, and we use at that center, um, whether it's a call center to evaluate it, or we automate the process so my, my cell phone will suddenly vibrate. I look at it and it says your blood sugar is out of range. Here's what you need to do immediately about it. So we have live monitoring. Again, none of these things I'm talking about are down the road. They're all here now in various stages of test or in use. Um, so personal metrics, let's track that ourselves. Um, uh, Mitchell and I were talking earlier about uh, you know, the amount of exercise done and, and the fact that, uh, and I'm trying to find him now where he, wherever he went. <laughs> there he is, OK. Um, you know, and how important it was every day. I mean, I weigh myself every morning, and then I adjust what I eat and, and how much exercise I get by trying to keep myself at my target weight. Incentivizing patients to practice health. That's the big one. How do we get people to do it? Now, recently in a test in Pennsylvania, they were using a test of a model, just like I described for you, self-monitoring. And it, it worked back through the smartphone. Well, these folks didn't have smartphones. So they were given it as part of the pilot. And if they participated, they got to keep the phone a year later. So there was an incentive for them in this particular case. So we, sometimes we have to incentivize good behavior. And then providing a schedule coaching and education for patients so that they can get what they need. In Osceola County, this phone to home program I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we're doing it with the fire department and Florida Hospital and uh, the community vision down there. That really got its start by um, a health summit about two years ago where somebody said, you know, we really don't get much service over here in the Four Corners area of, of Osceola County. Um, is there a way you can provide some type of support groups and other things? So we started looking at churches, and then I remember the light went on. We're sitting around the table, and somebody says, um, you know, we have these buildings all around Osceola County, and they're very easy to find. Most people know where they are anyway, and, and they've got these medical people in them. They're called fire stations. And that's how we move forward to moving toward community paramedicine, a realization that we have a network of services. And I'm in the communication with the fire chief in Seminole. I'm talking to Anthony Rios, Orange County EMS. We're talking about how do we move this concept and begin to advance it, uh, again, to support the uh, physician community. So let's finally talk about uh, per capita cost. Now, this is an example um, in terms of what does this mean to a physician? OK, so wait a minute. You're asking me to give up the fee-for-service model I've traditionally practiced and moved over to a capitation model. So I'm used to 100, and I'm just pulling these numbers just to give me an idea. $100 per visit, I've got 100 patients. An average of 3.2 annual visits means $32,000 in revenue. But oh, by the way, if I do a 30 per member per month payment from the insurance company times 100 times 12 months, that's 36000 So again, I'm being asked to make a switch uh, now, what this doesn't address, there's a reason we call it risk sharing or risk medicine. There is a risk to the physician's practice. And that risk is normally managed by using the SMART team we talked about, central referral service. So we're watching where those specialty referrals are going. Uh, looking at case management. Are there things we can do to intervene to keep the person well? And then at the same time, we carry stop, stop loss insurance so that if we reach the point where we have a major medical incident, it doesn't break the bank for the physician's practice. Now, this is um, uh, new. This is a reference pricing. So here's what we're going to see. We're going to see employers that are going to say, OK, in our market, here is what it is that um, a quality colonoscopy costs. So let's uh, suppose it's $1,200. Now, those that go to clinic A and clinic C, their colonoscopy is completely paid for because the cost of that procedure is less at those clinics. But on the other hand, if they choose instead, um, or the hospital, wherever it's being done, or if they instead decide to go ahead to clinics B or D, then they're going to be asked to pay the difference. So this is reference pricing. You see employers moving very rapidly to this in many markets across the country because they can, in some manner, have a control. They can still give people the freedom, their employees, the freedom to select what they want. But at the same time, they're giving them a reference um, and presuming, of course, as it says in the headline, best price and quality. So you're not just looking for um, uh, the price here. You're also looking for the quality, which we've seen, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Florida Healthcare Coalition, for years has been preaching that quality and cost both have to be considered. 
Then you, <clears throat> you've got bundled care. So right now, I bill separately fee-for-service for the diagnosis of the problem, the treatment of the problem, and then whatever rehab might be necessary. Instead, what we're going to see is bundled care. It started as the ACE concept. That, that was the name for it, being tested out in the Southwest. Hospitals were given the opportunity to go ahead without risk um, and to bundle care to see how they could get this up and running. Now you have hospitals all over the country that are moving to bundled care. So what happens is you take a group of physicians. If there is a radiologist involved, if there's an anesthesiologist, if there is a, uh, the orthopedic surgeon, whatever it is, and you bundle the services as a package. Um, when we look at the uh, accountable care organizations, uh, where again a group is coming together to try and be responsible for a defined population and provide that care, what we're seeing is some interesting ACO variations. And uh, I know we had a panel here a couple years ago about this, or a year and a half ago. And one of the things we talked about was the fact that some of these are being done around unique um, circumstances. So you have a program right now in South Florida that is testing this model. It's bundled care in the accountable care organization model. Um, and it's done for, for cancer patients. What they're doing is they sit down with the actuarials. They figure out what it costs for most individuals who are diagnosed with prostate cancer. What is the cost of that? Then how do we bundle that so that we include all of the elements? So wouldn't it be nice that you get one bill instead of getting bills from all of the different providers and services that you interact with within that service? And more so, imagine how much easier it is to compare. If you can now say, you know, I've just been diagnosed with breast cancer, and I have a choice. Do I want to go to the hospital on Rollins? Do I want to go to the hospital on Cool um, in Orlando? And, and if I'm going to do that, what are the quality and what are the price packages on their, on their uh, bundles? And I make the decision now a lot easier than sitting there and trying to figure out, okay, what are you going to charge doctor? What are you going to charge hospital that we've had up to this point? Now, we've talked about the three elements of um, care under the, um, uh, under the triple aim. Um, and all pieces, I think you can see, are connected together. How do we enhance and improve the population health at large? And population health doesn't just mean, uh, and uh, Dorothy's numbers were statistics, were, were very interesting this morning, but a, a population can be the population you have in your medical practice. So we're not talking about a huge population necessarily. I will share with you, I'm, uh, I participate in a very large group practice, and um, I got a call a month or two ago from my physician's office, an automated call that said, you know what, you're now due for your six-month follow-up on your blood work, um, and the next thing I get a letter in the mail with my order ready to go. Um, and um, all of that now being done by companies like Fitel and, and uh, Verisk and others who are analyzing populations, predicting what will happen if interventions are not done, and then providing the ability for groups to very easily automate many of the, the functions necessary to, to manage that population of, of individuals. Um, again, patient experience, the outcomes, the qualities that we're looking for, uh, the quality measurements and, and the uh, customer satisfaction and service involved, and then finally the per capita cost. You know, again, how do we control that? So I, I think, and I never realized it was Abe Lincoln actually who said this, but uh, I think the idea here is let's be aware of where things are going and the best thing you can do for your medical practice is to go ahead and create what it is that you want to see rather than waiting for someone else to create it for you. And I did ask for a commercial slide, so I'll leave this one up here. Uh, but uh, some of what you've seen this morning, um, we decided at the Health Council about a year ago uh, to work with a company that we've worked with before. It's 30 years history of teaching physician practices around the country. They have instructors on the ground in markets across the country, and they do webinars. And uh, actually, it'll be April, I think it's April 8th, um, will be a national webinar uh, vastly expanded beyond what you saw this morning, but talking about, not the triple aim necessarily, but talking about how to prepare your medical practice to move from the typical volume-based care and what will you need to know to move to value-based care. Um, so uh, for those practices interested, um, uh, the contact information is up there. Okay, Dan has the first question. Ken, I think I understand why you have the delta model on there because mm -hmm. it means change in mathematics. That's so true. That's true. And this is my question. As more off professionals that call or communicate regularly with provider groups, um, how do we best inject some education to ease the stress that they find in all these changes they're trying to implement and get them to actually believe it? 
Um, <clears throat> let me throw back for a minute to the Health Council. We um, just completed um, last year for the Central Florida Health uh, Cares Health System, which is the managing entity for behavioral health in our community, a 94-page needs assessment of behavioral health services, so mental health and substance abuse for four counties. That's the first time that I know that a needs assessment has been done in that population. It was done using real numbers um, that CARES was able to provide for us. So this was actually based on six months at that time of patient volume. We're now going to go ahead and look at 12 months. But patient volume provided by all the organizations that impact that population throughout the county. Now, how does that answer your question? We have solid numbers. We have charts. We have graphs. We now have the capability of mapping and identifying where are the problems and what are the nature of those problems. So what we have is the ability to rely on data and, and information to make that decision. I've shared with you just a few slides this morning, again, focused on sharing data. We know that we have a much more expensive health system than in other countries. And we know, presumably, a pretty good guess why we have that, as I shared earlier. So I think in order to make the case, and unfortunately, I think most of us change based on crisis. We wait until something happens before we change, instead of preparing for that change. Uh, but all we can do to make the case, I think, is share more and more statistics and numbers. Um, I remember in doing a scenario planning retreat for the leadership of Orlando Health a number of years ago, um, I started talking about this. My background at the AHA was building, micro, well, not building, but using micro simulation to show what would happen to an organization or what could, what could a hospital CEO do to build their organization. It was a two-day workshop we did in Orlando, and one of the individuals there was Mike Means. Um, some of you may know Mike, uh, retired now, but at that time the CEO of Holmes Regional Medical Center and um, uh, Health First Health System. Um, he went back to Health First, and if you look at the history of the Health First Health Plan, their insurance plan, it started right around the mid-1990s. And the reason is because he went through the sim, uh, simulation and he won. And he found out to win that you needed a payer system, you needed hospitals, and you needed physicians. And he had two of those. He didn't have the third. Well, today the Health First Health Plan has now moved into Volusia and will be moving with the Florida hospital name on it into central Florida. But the reason I bring it up is because he saw ahead of time what this could mean. So I came out of that simulation business, and a few years go by, and I'm working for Orlando Health, and I do scenario planning. I start talking about scenario planning, and John Hillemeyer, the CEO at the time, says, well, I don't, I don't want any games or something, but what is this all about? And we got to the point where the vice presidents were asking, when are we going to do that simulation, or when are we going to do that scenario stuff? And so we hit the tipping point. You, you know, if you're familiar with the book, The Tipping Point. So I saw the tipping point work to where we finally, everybody was asking for it. So the question is, how do we reach the tipping point for individual physicians? Where is that point of pain or realization? Um, my um, uh, informatics uh, intern sent me an email last night requesting information she has as part of another course to finish up a project related to population health. So I told her today, go by the office. I'm in mean, the office most of the day. But on my shelf is a magazine, one of those magazine uh, storage units marked population health. Every study or anything that I've come across for the last four years is in there. And so part of it is just proving it's moving in this direction. Do you want to wait, or do you want to get off the end of the dying product curve and on to the next? Painful jump, but has to be done. Mm -hmm. Jeff has a question. Hello, Jeff Holt with the PNC Bank Healthcare Business Banking. Got a question on some po points that you made were uh, excellent points, but... Uh, with uh, a large amount of patient care being done more so in the in the in home within the next mm -hmm. five years, along with the goal of being more proactive in mes medicine and as well as uh, expense control, um, where do you see telemedicine, telehealth? Which, so everybody knows, telemedicine is kind of more the education and electronic monitoring, and in, in, in incorporates also telemedic or tele telemedicine, which is more the video feed of uh, consults. So. Where do you see both of those, telemedicine and uh, telehealth, involved more so in in-home health care in order to you know, accomplish the goals that we need to accomplish? Great. Jeff, thanks for that question. I'm actually the policy chair for the Southeast Telehealth Resource Group out of Waycross, Georgia. We're doing a lot to promote and encourage the movement toward parity compensation for physicians, whether they see an individual patient face-to-face -face or using some type of an electronic intermediary. Um, we actually define telemedicine versus telehealth in a different way. 
telemedicine, and if you look at the Board of Medicine, they're all about telemedicine, and they want to make sure that they protect telemedicine, and it is for physicians. Telehealth is broader than that. And to give you an example right now, and I think it'll also go to answering your question, right now there are numerous patients, veterans, um, under the VA system with MS that would, if they didn't have the existing system already operating in the state of Florida, have to go from an area uh, up near Tallahassee and drive to Gainesville. Uh, now that might be for us a, a fairly decent drive. For them, at their age and with the, uh, the issues that they have, health issues or compromised health, I've already, and this is coming from the VA itself, they would have to make multiple stops along the way. It would become a full day journey. Instead, they go to what's called the CBOC, uh, which is a, basically a remote television, uh, tele um, health station uh, an hour from their home. And those are all being operated out of Gainesville, out of the VA in Gainesville. So the VA is a huge utili utilizer of telemedicine and telehealth, you know, looking at it from both ways. So uh, whether you do it that way or whether it appears to be something that is put into the retail health clinics, um, we're just going to see more of it. Um, when we look at how it's used, look at the um, health first example at, um, uh, that right now, again, in Brevard County. They put in an EICU, electronic intensive care unit, a number of years ago. And in the Vieira Hospital, if you end up in Vieira, you may not be in the ICU, maybe on a medical floor, and a robotic unit rolls in, camera and telemetry and everything else linked, and you're being overviewed beyond your local physician by physicians in a little room right there in Rockledge on Route 1, and they're monitoring you through the EICU. So we're seeing telemedicine and telehealth have been around for a long time. It's just that we're now dealing with some of the legislative issues that will open that up, just like um, we're trying to encourage scope of, of, of practice to be at the maximum for people's licenses. It seems like the physicians are concerned about losing the, that ability to do the consults and service their patients to outside, the physicians outside of the state because of mm -hmm. the ability to be remote. Right, right now, you know, if you're going to, to provide that service, you've got to provide it within the state. Uh, the model that I shared with you in Pensacola, that test was Pensacola to areas of the panhandle within Florida. Uh, there's an awful lot of ways to do those things without looking at going across state lines. Um, and if you think about connections, for those of you who are familiar with that company here in Orlando, um, a few years ago I got a chance to tour them when I had my insurance agency, and they had reps that were selling insurance across the country, each one licensed in the state that they were handling in the connections call center. Um, so no reason why we can't put licensed physicians in a central location. They're licensed in the state, and that's the only state they practice in. Okay, so that, there's an answer. I will tell you um, that, uh, and I'm real pleased with this, there's a friend of mine whose daughter, we managed to get into, well, she managed to get into FSU in their advanced medical program. They start in freshman year. There's only 14 of them selected on this fast track to planning to be physicians. Um, and thanks to the FSU program here in Orlando, they were able to get her into this program. I've had multiple discussions with her and her dad and have said clearly, you know, her playing with video games was a good thing because get used to the fact that in large part, physician opportunities will be at one end of a telehealth or telemedicine connection. Don't tell my 13-year-old that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, first of all, for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, covered a, a wide area and did a little bit of depth on top of it, so I appreciate that. A uh, question I had has to do with habits. Um, you, you touched on uh, prevention, tying that in with value basis. Uh, and on the personal level would be habits of individuals, whether it's brushing teeth, what they eat. You touched on some of those. My question is, are, are we looking for this system to also initiate medical practices looking into the personal habits of each individual patient, whether it's on an automated basis, kind of like an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that is something that's part of this wave coming forward, because we, I, I personally haven't seen it and with my physician, or have I heard it from other practices, and I'm in medical practice field um, for management. What, if that is something that is coming, what, in what way would that be initiated, and, and how do we see that impacting uh, preventive care? It's a really good question because, again, it, you know, um, we talked a little bit about incentives as a way you can incentivize. Um, there are organizations that are providing now, and I mentioned it earlier, the Stanford uh, Chronic Care and other services 
But one of the things they do beforehand is they do a determination of whether an individual is ready for that uh, process. Are they, um, are they going to follow through on the course? Are they going to do the things that they have to do to make a difference? And a certain percentage of the population won't comply. Um, so as a result of that, they try as much as they can to weed them out on the front end, and some people are not going to be able to participate in that online education. Some of those individuals are going to end up having to go through a course or some other means to get them to comply um, that patient engagement, if you will. Um, now, along with that, with that attempt to try and get them engaged, we can incentivize. Another incentive for them to participate is the cost of the, to their own wallet or purse. Um, and as we see more and more individuals with their own insurance outside of the employer, what we're seeing as well is um, the fact that, oh, if I don't do this, it's going to cost me money. Um, and how do we bring home the fact that if they do those things that are right for themselves, it's a different type of incentive. It's just a, I guess, a disincentive. Or um, what is it that you're going to do for yourself that's going to keep you healthy so that you do it because for economic reasons as well? Um, and I'm, I, there was a third story that I wanted to share with you that went right to your point, and now again, I've, I've, that one slipped out. But um, so I think, how do we incentivize and get people to do what they what they will do, or also? How do we help the caregiver? Because we're also talking about individuals who may not have the ability themselves to learn this. So how do we give them the education or the caregiver the education and the support necessary to provide to that individual? Probably what's not fair, and, and I'm thinking part of your question too, may be um, the fact that we're holding physicians responsible for the health of a population. But how do they do that if that population is not willing to comply? Um, is a basic question. And uh, I don't have a necessary answer to it other than the fact that, um, you know, a, well, let me give you an idea. Um, at the beginning, first week of February, uh, we're working with a health plan, the only plan of its kind in the U.S. that got written into the Affordable Care Act as appropriate mandatory coverage. And now that organization is very interested in coming to Florida. It's operating in one state in the union. We've made a connection. Um, and the president and the primary mover and shaker on this, they've been in Washington with CMS, and they're talking about moving it to Florida. So we're now in discussions with them of how to bring it to Florida, and all of the health councils will be meeting with them in February. The reason I mention this is because this plan, just to give you an idea, it's $55 per member per month that the employee pays, 55 that the employer pays, and then there's a third payment, and that can come from a variety of sources, and that's the reason why we're looking at where would it come from in the state of Florida. This is for individuals with, uh, you know, they're employed, but they're, they're not, they don't have a huge amount of money. There is no deductible. They're covered for all primary care, and they're covered for hospitalization and anything else that occurs at that price point. But they have to comply. The first thing when you sign in, you sit down with a case manager. They go through. They do the basic biometric check on you. They look at your history. And if you're hypertensive, you're told this is the course for hypertensive you know, tensive individuals. You have to be there. If you drop out of that, you will be dropped out of the plan. That's another way of looking at a model that's basically forcing you to do what's right if you want to save money. So it goes back to the pocketbook or the, the wallet. Did that um, address? OK. And I wish I could remember the other story because it was a great one. But if I think of it, I'll let you know. We do have another question here. Hi, uh, good morning, Ken. Thank you for your excellent presentation. I'm new here to the group. Um, my name is Dr. Romy Mushtaq, a traditional neurologist with additional board certification in integrative medicine, mm -hmm. which is ABPS. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. And just for the group, this is not alternative medicine. This isn't about disease management anymore, but the science behind health and wellness. 61 medical schools in the United States, unfortunately, none in Florida have programs like this. You know, my own mind-body medicine training was through Harvard Medical mm -hmm. School. And it addresses this, and I wonder if you've considered this in the model, is creating a partnership with the patient, with someone on the SMART team, whether it is the physician or what we find at the Center of Natural Integrative Medicine Works is certified behavioral coaches or psychologists that are partnering with people to help them understand core behaviors. And so just an example would be is the core behavior of managing behaviors that lead to obesity. And we know if we cut it at that model right mm -hmm. there, 
as far as eating and what motivates to exercise, stress management, where now then the downstream is effectively managing or preventing diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. And, and I really would wonder if, if that's something you all have considered. Um, and I'd, I'd love to talk to you offline or to the group more about that because I'd love to see more partnerships being made with patients as a provider who has spent now 15 years managing chronic diseases. The problem with us at the Center for Natural Integrative Medicine, we realize we're one of the oldest freestanding integrative medicine clinics in the country is this is a concierge medicine practice which only the wealthy now can come yeah. to afford. And I would love to see these models initiated like they are now through the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio where it's reaching the entire population. So I, I wonder if that's been a consideration with the outstanding work your council's doing. Thank you. As a matter of fact, Monday night, I met with a, um, a PhD wellness coach to large employers and we're working together on grant funding related to behavior, changing behavior. Thinking about BJ Fogg out in California who's got a website where you can actually say, okay, I want to do this for this amount of time or I want to change my habit for this amount or permanently this is what I need to go through to do that. So as a matter of fact, we're exactly there. We're trying to figure out how to give um, physician community and others um, the ability to make that change. Um, very quickly, my first healthcare career job in, was at Southlake Hospital in Claremont, and uh, I was doing rounds on the floor, and the nurses said, there's this gentleman in there who's just, you know, totally non-compliant, doesn't want to see his physician, doesn't want anything. So I went in, and I, you know, I'm just brand new in healthcare. So I said, just out of curiosity, what would you be doing if you weren't here? I'd be sitting home watching my favorite TV shows, and I'd have my popcorn and my soda, and so I went out to the nurses, I found out what his diet requirements were, and we were a small hospital. I got in the car, drove to Publix bought the soda that he could have, you know, sugar-free, whatever it was, bought the low-salt popcorn, whatever it was, brought it back, gave it to the nurse, didn't take it in, said, here, go ahead. An hour later, they called, so it's worked. He wants to see his doctor. We gave him some degree of control. So we put him back in a position where he had some degree of control that he could do himself. There was a, um, a communication that went on uh, through a patient who was on the monitoring service at Orlando Health a few years ago who I heard. And he was given the requirement to set on, you know, get on the scale every morning and so forth. And he was, again, very non-compliant. But he did what he had to do. Well, it came time to pull him off the system. He didn't want it out of there because he was competing now for himself to see how well he could perform, right? There's a physician, Dr. Schuler, I work with out in Brevard County who has the triage system that runs the VA triage system nationwide. And he's now developed a system that he'll be marketing soon that's being in test right now at the VA and Health First that uh, it's the same thing that I have on my smartphone, but it's a next generation. And it allows me to, once I've identified what my problem is, it gives me an ability to increase my score by complying with what I should be doing. So um, we're fully there where you are because, again, it's, it really isn't fair to hold physicians to a, you know, an expectation that they're going to be able to accomplish this without that patient engagement as well. Now, I know we didn't get a chance to get to everybody's questions, and of course, as with anything, you'll think of that question on the drive back to the office. So please feel free to go to the LinkedIn Moroff Open Group, where the discussion can continue. So if you ha do have that question, feel free to reach out and, and ask it on there, so that way, uh, you know, Ken or other folks that might be experts in that area can put their input in and the discussion continue on. And that is a great resource as well anytime during the, uh, the, the months when you have a question or like, hey, I need help with whatever, or hey, this is a great article that has, is great new research or whatever the case might be to keep the discussions going, keep everything alive. We have over 680 members in our open group and that provides an opportunity to, uh, to continue to be that resource 24-7, 365. So that's always very exciting. Um, again, uh, we want to appreciate Ken for having joined us with that.